Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, I first met Ray Desmond Jones, or RDJ if you like, for short, in the mid 1970s, just after I had taken up with my new partner, the former New York poet, Harold Novak, a terrific poet. Soon after meeting Carol, I moved to Sydney to live with her. In the mid to late 70s, it was a great time to be in the Harbour City I came in. and to be alive, generally. At that time, Sydney's artistic and literary world was very dynamic. A bohemian Eden, one continuous party, fizzing up like champagne. <laughs> it was all very exciting and very social. I soon met Carol's friends, including RDJ. Revolving in the same social circle were Ken Bolton, Anna Kuani, Joanne Burns and many others. Ray and I soon became friends and we really enjoyed our deadly serious and very silly and witty exchanges, the wit coming from Ray rather than me, talking about poetry and politics and the fast shifting landscape of Australian culture and the rapid social change of that era. Here's an anecdote. Ray had an abiding interest in numerology, which is a belief in the supposed connection between the unfolding fate of one's life and crucial numbers derived from your name, birth date and etc. This, I think, was connected with Ray's deep and creative love of language and of its hidden possibilities. As a very odd hobby, Ray would sometimes set up a little busker's store in King's Cross to read for free um, the numerology of passers-by. And I would sometimes meet Ray there for a coffee and a chat. I don't know how it happened, but on a whim, probably after something a lot stronger than coffee, <laughs> we decided one day to do a, a long Ponce walk, Ponce walk, right around King's Cross. Now, this was a very dangerous thing to do. By doing our absurd stroll, we meant to send up all the spibs, the thugs, and the creeps who daily hung around King's Cross and who Ray regarded as, quote, ponces, that is, as silly, self regarding, would be posh tats. Luckily, the spibs and croons thought we were just being eccentric that day. <laughs> and we're not having a go at them. So we both survived to tell the tale. Ray and I often laughed about it later. Now, this is how we do a Ponce walk, as Ray instructed me, and I followed in tandem with him, doing a Ponce walk. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so a ponce which we did right around King's Cross. You get the picture. Now, Ray was not naive about the ways of the world. He was very hard nosed, astute wickedly satirical, <laughs> intelligent, but also gentle, warm, insightful, kindly, 
and very funny. Actually, Ray had a backbone literally made of steel. He was born in Broken Hill in 1941, the son of a miner. There were limited opportunities in that tough town, close to nil, even for a clever kid like Ray. So he left school at 14 and took up some manual slag and slog sort of jobs until sick of the never-ending dead end of it all. He entered Sydney University in 1974 with help from the International Workers' Education Association. <coughs> the disturbing fire and flux of Ray's early working life is underlined in his poem, Blast Furnace, which tells of how he witnessed a fellow worker's death in a steel foundry in Wyala. It was, quote, when a man in khaki overalls slipped and fell in a slow arc, left hand grabbing air, nothing, a scream and a smear of a paper oil. Nobody knew him, so nothing happened because there wasn't anything to bury or remember. After graduating from uni, Ray worked in the then Commonwealth Employment Service, where his very insightful industry experience was highly valued. He eventually became a history teacher in the public education system. At around this same period, Ray also became a devoted family man. One of his most tender and moving poems is dedicated to his daughter, titled <coughs> Dear Elise. And I remember just a few years ago or so, it seems, meeting Ray <coughs> with his wife Helen and son Bevan and Elise in a restaurant overlooking Bondi Beach. It was a lovely sunny spring day with a touch of brine in the air and very jolly. So, Finally, in 2004, Ray became mayor of Ashfield, which is west of Newtown, if you know Sydney, in South Sydney, where he and his political allies fought numerous political campaigns against so-called developers, who Ray thought were destroying the neighbourhood for the sake of a few grubby dollars more than a little like the Ponce's Crimson Touts of King's Cross, who he knew so well. <coughs> Ray once said that for him, quote, poetry and politics are mutually contradictory, and I find consolation from each in the arms of the other. Amusingly, Ray was always an unabashed, out there, very stylish dresser and his huge black-rimmed um, wide hat remains an icon of Oz Lip. He loved his flamboyant mayoral robes too, particularly as photos show. <laughs> Ray hung up his mayoral chains in 2007, age 66, but didn't slow down a bit. He went on to publish further excellent work right until the very end and with absolutely no loss of creative vitality. We, must, we, we, we last met for lunch, along with my partner Shan, in a restaurant in the rocks overlooking Sydney Harbour. There Ray told me about his eventual fatal illness. Apparently it was a melanoma, which went dangerously undetected because it was out of sight on the bottom of his foot. It was not surgically removed in time and metastasized, spreading fatally to other parts of his body. Maybe the Sydney sun seekers are more prone to skin cancer than the rest of us, but wherever you live, when having a skin check, please also look at your feet. As a writer, Ray was highly versatile. He penned a collection of short stories in the 70s, then two 
uh, novels in the 90s. And as a leading Australian poet, he took Oz poetry A all the way with RDJ. Ray's first poetry collection was published in 1973, Orpheus with a tuba. Another 13 collections followed, culminating this very year in the end of the line from Rushwood Press, a volume so aptly and poignantly named. For more than 46 years, Ray Desmond Jones has remained one of Australia's most challenging and rewarding writers, putting his indelible thumbprint on Australian poetry. And such a pity that RDJ can't be here today to celebrate his swan song book with us. Perhaps he can part a storm cloud or two, God knows we need the rain, and send down a thunder jolt or two. Now I've been asked to read a few of Ray's poems from the end of the line, which I will do. The first one's called Grandpa, very short. Grandpa. My grandfather was a labourer when labourers were poor. He couldn't afford a wedding ring, unscrewed a washer from the laundry door. Third finger, left hand, and a bit of butter. And he said, I do, without a stutter. Thank you, Ralph. The next one is called Shame. Ashamed of my government and my country, those comfortable guys in Canberra who want to tow asylum seekers to Indonesia. Ashamed of the bland professionalism of men and women in suits standing on stairs speaking with professional eloquence to the media. Ashamed that I cannot call a half-truth a beautiful, blatant lie without being sued. Ashamed of the stupidity of morons who shoot down a civilian jet, then disappear into the distance like naughty boys throwing stones. Ashamed of a race that can understand DNA and read the temperature of a distant star, while flicking a lighter against a gas jet that could ignite the world. Ashamed of my lethargy and my own decay. Ashamed of the body of a warming world which may not long survive me. The human race. The human race is truly fucked. But I'm not one of those. I want to be one of the other apes. And swing from tree to tree. Don't want to wear leather shoes. No cows have been bad to me. Sit on a branch of a cool tree, searching in your fur, eating fleas that taste like nuts. Clean my teeth with sticks. Apes don't kill any other apes, just punch them in the eye. Apes are nice, and all of them, nicer than all of us. They don't drop bombs down from the sky. They don't wave flags in salute. A bit of a biff now and then makes an ape a better friend. So if you want to be civilised, swing in the trees and grow some hair. Right, and Ode to the Minorities, the second last poem I'll read. Ode to the Minorities. It's not the minorities that are the problem, it's the majorities. Combine them, and there's too many for a good old-fashioned dishonest cop to handle. The law was invented for the minority, 
the ones that can give out the lollies at the birthday party where cakes reach to heaven, a skyscraper of sugar and frosted air. Bring back the good old days before the blight of anti-heroes, where men were men and women weren't in the action shots. But nobili nobility has passed from the earth with all those rare, fine distinctions. For those that hath, all shall be given. For those that hath not, all shall be taken away. Engrave it above the gates of the playground. Bring back the cane. Let them eat chalk. Um, and finally, Ray will have the last word. This is called silence. In silence, the world draws in her breath. A candle flutters outside the wind and darkness, but inside feels warm. The earth in which we have meaning slides and lifts her skirt across the dance floor. Still, she continues to dance, an old child, breathing out music we hear, but do not fully understand. Thank you.